Good evening, everyone. Good evening. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And if you would, please stand with me as we read God's Word. We'll read the whole chapter, beginning in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. This is God's holy word. Let us hear it together. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, that is of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
and I will lift up my heart and mouth to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you have given us your word. O Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through it. O Lord, give me the boldness that is requisite for preaching your word. And give your people ears to hear. Give me a, a heart to hear as well, O Father. O Lord, speak to your church. Call those that you have not yet called. Be merciful to us, we pray. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. The topic tonight is why the Apostle Paul wants you to understand effectual calling. And of course, when we say the Apostle Paul, we're speaking of the one who inspired Paul to write these words, the Holy Spirit. Why must you understand effectual calling? I will start with a question. What is the link between what God has done in the far distant past and your salvation now? There are several ways that we could answer that question, several true answers we could give to it, because there are different pieces, if we may call it that, of God's work revealed to us in Scripture that connect us now with what took place in the distant past, with what Christ accomplished for us in his life for us, his death for us, and his resurrection for us, and his ascension into glory. We have the Word of God, the Scripture that is like the vehicle that brings to us the mighty work of God in the past. It brings us into our present. We have preachers called and equipped by God to declare the works of God that He has revealed and preserved in the Scripture. And these preachers are called and equipped by God to give us the Word and apply it to us today. So they serve as a kind of link between what God did in the past and our present situation now. We have the church of Jesus Christ that stands to guard and protect and accredit and send these preachers. And the pillar the church serves, as we heard recently, as the pillar and ground of the truth that preserves the scripture in faithfully proclaiming it. We have the vital work of the Holy Spirit in bringing us into the experience and enjoyment of the gospel. And Paul, in this passage, looks at a particular aspect of that work of the Holy Spirit. And he focuses, uh, focuses our attention on the effectual call wrought by God the Father through the Holy Spirit to call his people out of darkness into light. And he looks at this, the Apostle Paul looks at this work of God, this effectual calling, as the pivotal thing, the primary link between what we are now and what God did in the past. And this is no theoretical topic or subject because our view of this medium, the means, the primary deciding factor that really effectively brings us into the Christian life will shape how we view our place in the Christian life and how we function in it. Specific to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if the medium of our salvation is simply the word as literature, and the stuff of religion is simply propositional truth, then those who are saved are simply people who are good at thinking and processing doctrine. Heretics are those who are not so bright, and people who are saved are those who get it, theoretically, philosophically, understanding the word as such on its own. And that would mean that then the best Christians are just the sharpest thinkers, the most analytical, and the natural result would be that they deserve the credit for their great thinking skills. And so then in the Christian church, gurus and philosophers would vie for their place in the church of Jesus Christ. And we would all be always trying to become more and more recognized by other men for knowing and understanding more things. But the truth is absolutely essential. 
And those who know the truth best in a true and biblical way are the most faithful Christians. But what is it that makes them so? Is it simply their skill? Is it simply their, their, their abilities? And Paul says no. Paul fights that view, and he sees it as having a poisonous effect here in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians by showing that Christ's gospel and our coming into the experience of the power of it is not simply the application of natural wisdom. Also, if the medium of salvation, the thing that connects what God did in the past to what we are now was simply the right authoritative leaders who possess a mystical power or, or the right organizational power like the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church teaches, then the stuff of religion would mean just getting in as best as you could with these leaders and climbing the ladder as high as you could. You would exalt the great men and try to become a great man yourself. And you would end up with arguments about who to follow and, and how connected you are to these great ones. But Paul fights that view as well in this passage. He says, no, your experience of Christ and God's working in you is not simply connected to some great man and people were connecting it to Paul. They said, well, I was baptized by Paul. Paul says, I didn't baptize hardly anybody in Corinth. And that's not what makes you have status in the gospel. Paul says that the crucial bond that connects you as a modern living Christian with God's wonderful salvation accomplished in the past is the effectual calling of God. Your wisdom is not to credit. A great leader can't get the glory. God gets the glory. So that he that glories or boasts must glory or boast in the Lord. Now, as I, as I look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I have to give a little disclaimer. I'm not going to do a full exposition of the passage. That would take a long time, and it would be fun. But we won't do that tonight. What we'll do is we'll look briefly at a theme that Paul focuses on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is the theme of calling. And then we'll look at how Paul uses that theme to promote Christian unity in a contentious situation in Corinth. Let's read again chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, you called ones, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, gifts of the Holy Spirit, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom, by God, ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So how does Paul define Christians in Corinth? He greets them here, and in his greeting, he views them in their most basic character. And who are they? This is, as he says, the church of God at Corinth. Now, you might remember that our English word church is a translation of a Greek word that means roughly a called out assembly. And these, this called out assembly of God that's at Corinth, it's been sanctified in Christ Jesus. It's in union with a worldwide family of saved ones who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and our Lord, Paul says. But what brought them into the enjoyment of these special characteristics there in verse 2? What made them that church? He says, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to them more sanctified, called to be saints. God reached down into this 
that period of time there in Corinth and called some people. He called them by the gospel and by the power of the Holy Spirit. God did an action. God did something. God had already done something in Christ in the past. He had already done a redemptive work. But then these Corinthians now are living a couple of decades probably later after the work of Christ has been accomplished and God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, brings the effect of what Christ had done into their lives, makes it real for them, brings them into the experience of it, sets them apart, sanctifies them, makes them holy, makes them a called out assembly for his name by calling them. Christians are Christians because God calls them to be Christians. So Paul wishes his blessings upon them, thanks God for them, expects that the same way God has affirmed their testimony by his rich gifts of grace, he'll confirm it to the end. And they will be blameless at the day of Jesus Christ because God called them. How are they different from the rest of the people in Corinth? Christ died on the cross years before that, and historically, everyone at Corinth stands in a historic relation to Jesus Christ because Christ died before all of them were at this time. Christ died before all of us are here, but what sets the saints apart? God, by his gospel and his Holy Spirit, effectually calls them, brings them into the inheritance of receiving the blessings that Christ purchased for them. So, Paul says, the reason you are a Christian today is because of God's call. God called, that's why you're in. God's call defines you as a Christian. Now, this letter of 1 Corinthians, as everyone here, I'm sure, is well aware, the book of 1 Corinthians is written to a very troubled church. And the first issue that Paul brings up, among many issues that he will bring up in, in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is the issue of disunity or contention. There was a lack of unity in the church at Corinth. So let's read a little bit about that in verses 10 through 16. Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, they've been called by God into the fellowship of this Jesus Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, you called ones, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then he gives his reason for bringing this up. He says someone has told on them. There's a tattletale at the church at Corinth. It's actually not a tattletale. It's not a bad thing. Someone faithfully had passed on the bad news to Paul that there was trouble in the church, that he, by God's commissioned by God's, the responsibility God had given him, Paul had a responsibility to address this issue. So he says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. In other words, it doesn't matter. I can't remember who I baptized there, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't very many people. And you're making, taking the wrong point from focusing on who baptized who. There was contention in the church, and the focus of this contention was men and their reputations and people's relationship to these men. The contention was about the honor of associating or the spiritual pedigree from certain men. I'm related to so-and-so, I'm related to this other one, and the most spiritual of all, I'm related to Christ. Well, by saying so, they were cutting off the apostles of Christ, like Paul, and the servants of Christ, like Apollos. You can serve Christ and listen to the men Christ sent, right? The contention was about the honor of being connected with these men, reflecting achievements and wisdom and strength and power. The root of it all was pride, human pride. Now, 
let's pause and notice something. This divided group, this group of people who are all concerned about these contentious questions of who they're connected with and who they're following, these people are a church of Jesus Christ. It's a true church. Chapter 1, verse 2, the church of God, which is at Corinth. This church is an encouragement to Paul, even while they are in such trouble. In verse 4, he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. This church, this group of people who are having this contention are enriched by the Spirit with gifts. In verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, so much so that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them. They're waiting for the second coming of Christ. They have the faithfulness of God to keep them. As he mentions in verse 9, God is faithful by whom ye were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is a church of Jesus Christ, a true church, with many of the great blessings that Christ has given his churches and yet, they are torn apart by dissension, contention, fueled by pride. To address this contention, he addresses it directly, reproves them here in verses 10 through, um, through 11. He invokes the name of their common Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, who is the Lord of each of them and the one that they should all be bowing in allegiance to. He says, I beseech you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing. Stop this thing of pitting yourselves one against another, but speak one thing in Christ. He exhorts them to unity. He says, speak the same thing. Let there be no divisions among you. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now that's a high calling. To have the same mind and the same judgment, to speak the same thing is a high calling. He reproves that division into sects around the personalities of men in verses 11 through 16. He says, you say this, you say I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And he says, my example of ministry wouldn't give you the background for doing that. He says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And that brings us to the next section, which is verses 17 through 25. And in this section, Paul declares that God uses a weak medium to do a mighty work. And that's the call of sinners into a relationship with God. There is a weak medium the gospel, and it does a mighty work, calls men into relationship with God, saves sinners. Let's read verse 17 again. For Christ sent me not to baptize, not to establish some group who would follow me and say, yeah, we're the Paulites. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So the gospel is something in this world that is weak. Now, it's not weak in itself. It, when, when the Lord, when God sent his son into this world and the Lord Jesus Christ lived in this world and did amazing miracles, lived that perfect life, died on that cross, rose again from the dead, that was not weak. And that message that comes down from that time to Corinth or from that time down to now, wherever it reaches in the world, the message in itself is not weak but it's weak because of the blindness and deafness and darkness of the hearts to those it comes to. It is a weak and foolish message to the world. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's not just something to ignore, but something to scoff at, something to despise. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now notice the relationship there. It's not that 
we're saved and then it's the power of God. It's that it's the power of God. And that's why we're saved. As he goes on, we'll see that. Paul says that this is the genius of God's working in the world with his people. It is his intention that he would use a foolish means and that only his power would make the difference between those who are not saved and those who are. Those who do not respond and those who do. Those who consider it foolishness and those who are overwhelmed and transformed, miraculously changed by the power of the gospel. It's God's power, God's act that makes the difference. He says in verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's the genius of God in the gospel, is that the world will laugh and scoff, but God is crushing this world. He will destroy it. He will burn the lost. And those who reject his gospel, those to whom the gospel is foolishness, they will spend eternity in hell. And so Paul rolls out more of this, this picture of the genius of God's method in the world. In verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God, by his act, when the preaching is going forth, he saves his people. Here in verse 21, he calls it saving them that believe. But a little later, you'll notice he calls it calling again. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So in verse 18, Paul says that believers are those who are saved. In verse 21, he calls them them that believe. And in verse 24, he calls them them which are called. The message is foolishness and its weakness to those who perish. The message of the cross of Christ a, a criminal's death for the Jewish Messiah. And for, so the Jews would despise that, that shameful and despicable situation that they see this man, Jesus Christ, as he hangs upon that cross. They say, yes, yeah, see, the Old Testament said that such a one is cursed of God. So they would despise such a message. And the Greeks, the Gentiles, would despise the idea of death on behalf of all men resurrection you know in acts when paul visited athens it says that the philosophers mocked some of them mocked when they heard of the resurrection they still mock when they hear of the resurrection of our lord jesus christ so what makes the difference paul says it is that they are called they are saved they are them that believe and god saves them Let's pause just for a minute and think about this word called because there's a general sense in which all who hear the words of the gospel are called. They hear beautiful words like Christ died to save sinners. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They hear the son of God himself say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So the general, the general declaration of God's truth goes out widely and freely, and many hear who do not respond. But that is not the sense of the call that Paul is speaking of here, because the way Paul is using the word call, it is a saving call, as he says here that, God uses the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, and that saving is to those same ones who are called, both Jews and Gentiles. So the call is a saving call. It's an effectual call. It works because it's God's act. 
Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see that many people are hearing the word who are not saved. They think the word is foolishness and weakness. And then in contrast, there are these here who hear the gospel and are called by God. And so what Paul is talking about here in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians is what theologians call the effectual call. It's a saving call, or sometimes people use the word a special call. It's the same way that Paul uses the word in Romans chapter 8. You'll probably remember Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. In Romans 8, we don't see someone who is called and falls short of justification. We see those who are foreknown, predestinated, called, justified, and glorified all the way from eternity past to eternity future. They are secure in God's glorious saving purpose. We see Paul mention it, actually not Paul, we see John mention it with another name in John 6, 44. John, as he's quoting our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus says, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. What is that drawing? It's the effectual call. And I will raise him up at the last day. Well, there's that glorified that we just heard about from Romans chapter 8. Those who are called in this way, who are drawn by the Father, who are, and Paul uses the words, the, the language of God calling these lost ones in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we have this, this calling that brings us all the way to resurrection to life and resurrection to glory at the last day. And this, this word call, often as it's used throughout the New Testament, is the effectual call. It's the call that makes the difference between those who don't hear and those who do. Paul says in Ephesians, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That's not just the general invitation. That's not just the words of the gospel, but it's the ones that brought these people out of darkness and raised them up out of their tomb of sin and gave them life. And now they are, are rejoicing in the glorious eternity that's ahead of them and in this walk with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, the calling wherewith you are called. That's the call to walk with Christ that works. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. So Paul has this great view of an effectual, special call. And that's what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But what is, why, why did Paul bring it up? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Why did Paul bring up the call here? And, and as we look at it, we see the difference between effective preaching and failed ministry can be explained primarily by the activity of God. Either God effectually called the sinner, or he did not. What makes the difference between those who mock the sermon, who say it's foolishness and weakness, and we've heard both, and those who bow, trembling and crying, weeping to the living Lord Jesus Christ for mercy and finding hope and rest and joy in the gospel? What is it that makes the difference? The power of God, the act of God, the calling of God the Father. Human rhetoric will not make the difference. Skillful use of wise words is not the answer. Displays of human powers of eloquence and personal charm, skill, or human effort will, not, will do nothing for saving souls. God must call the sinner through the gospel. The gospel goes out to all men, but God calls his elect through the gospel. And if God does not work, the gospel will do nothing at all. That is not because of any drawback or failure or weakness on the part of the gospel. It is because of the utter depravity and sinfulness of man. Without the power of God actively working, the gospel of Jesus Christ preached 
will fade out and die like an echo in a lonely valley. No one will hear, no one will respond, and no one will be saved. Now, there's tons of applications to this truth of effectual calling. But Paul gives us a big one. But I'll save his just for a little later because it's in the rest of chapter 1 here. First, let's just think, if, if God effectually calls his people, then that puts us in an expectation to see the action of the living God in our personal Christian experience. As we mentioned already, Christians are not primarily philosophers, though we should embrace true philosophy. Christians are not first apologists and debaters, though we should be good at defending and defining the truth from God's word. Christians are not primarily moralists who find good rules from the Bible about how to live and try to apply it to their lives and others. That's not the first thing we are. It is something we are. We are to be moralists. We are to go and study and search and say, how should we live? That's good. But that's not where we start. That's not, that's not what defines who we are. Remember how Paul defined the Corinthian believers at the beginning, those who are called. Those who have the, the activity of the living God is manifest in their lives. They have been convicted, illuminated, regenerated, and their life has been transformed by the power of the living God. God did something. Think back to your own experience. What is it that moved you from being either a pew sitter or somebody who just was reveling in the wickedness of this world? What is it that moved you from that to loving God with all your heart? I know that you fall and you fail, but what is it that moved you from earnestly seeking your flesh to earnestly seeking God? It was the call of God. It was the work of God. It wasn't the first time you heard a reasonable sermon. It was the first time God opened your heart to hear while you heard. It was the first time God showed you yourself and showed you the living Christ. So this doctrine of effectual calling should make us bow low in praise to God. We hear those words of Jesus Christ so sweet and yet so cutting to human pride. I have not, I'm sorry, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Jesus Christ chose you, not you choosing him. Effectual calling should give hope to our preaching of the gospel. Why do we see so little fruit and little response? Because we are preaching a gospel that is foolishness to the flesh and a stumbling block to religious sensibilities. We are doing an impossible work. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth because he makes it so. And there have been times when people have spent years seeking to establish churches, seeking to expand the work of the kingdom of God, and then in one day, the Lord, by his sovereign power, does more than they were able to do in decades or centuries. And then sometimes the Lord makes us wait and see little fruit. But it's still his work. It's not ours. Now, we, sh we must be faithful. We must seek him. We must walk with him. But it's his work. And we also see if, if effectual calling is true, then prayer is not a game. If God told, uh, told us to preach a flesh-withering, impossible message, and we submit to go out at his command, then we are dependent on him. He either makes the word fruitful or he does not. So pray, brethren, pray. If you preach, pray. If you don't preach, but you love your brethren who preach, Pray. Pray for them. If you love your own soul, pray. Pray for God to work in you by the word because the words tickling your ears will do you no good. But him working by the Holy Spirit in your heart will do an eternity of good. Effectual calling also sets the supernatural beginning for a life of supernatural living. As they began, so they continue. Christians are a people of a heavenly father who miraculously called them and now daily provides, guides, rules, directs, comforts, strengthens, empowers them. This is a supernatural life. If it began with his sovereign power, it continues with sovereign power. 
trust the king who rules your life. He began it, he'll finish it. But what application does Paul give us? Those were my applications. Paul gives us the rest of this chapter. And I've already told, it what, told you what it is. God's effectual call prevents fleshly boasting before God and calls us to boast in the Lord and therefore increases the unity of the church of Jesus Christ. He addressed the believers in Corinth as the called ones. And then he hones in on their primary issue at hand, which is dissension, contention. They're fighting over personalities and who they're going to follow. And Paul takes them on this little excursion through the effectual call of God. And he ends up with, let therefore no one boast in, let no flesh boast in his presence. And he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. This is verses 26 through the end of the chapter. So how does Paul apply this truth? He says that it should so humble the pride of man that it promotes true spiritual unity in the church of Jesus Christ. In verse 26, he says, For ye see your calling, brethren. After he's talked about how the gospel is foolishness and weakness to those who are unenlightened, those who are not called in this effective way by God, but it is the power of God to those who are called. Then he says, now look at your calling, brethren. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught, things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And by flesh, he means man, human, earthly desires and achievements. Notice your calling. Notice how God humbles the pride of men by how he calls his special people. When, he, when the gospel is being preached, God ordinarily reaches out to people who do not impress anybody with their greatness. He opens the eyes of a Lydia. He opens the eyes of a centurion. He opens the spiritual, spiritual center of undesirable people in this world. And he brings them into his kingdom. And he shows his glory and his power in their lives so that no one, no flesh, no man would glory or boast in his presence. He leaves the proud and the mighty behind. Notice that this effectual call flows from his election. It's a sovereign call, verse 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. He gathers tax collectors and fishermen and makes them his disciples and passes by Pilots and Nero's and Caesar's and Herod's and Pharisees and scribes. And, and it's rare to find someone who is of an elevated position in human society who is called into this communion, this fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's on purpose. God does that because he wants to do it, to honor himself, to bring glory to his name and not to man. So this all should prevent any man from boasting in God's presence. But not only does it call us away from boasting in God's presence, but it calls us to boast in the Lord. And that's verses 30 and 31. But of him, of God the Father, are ye... You are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So while God is reaching down into this world and sovereignly according to his eternal purpose and to demonstrate the glory and majesty of his power while he's reaching down and calling people that we would despise, we would look down on, we would not exalt, we would not say, ah, yes, I can now, you know, now Christianity has a good name because so-and-so got saved. 
No, none of that. God is honoring his name and letting all flesh go to the wayside. While he's doing that, those who are called, God showers his goodness upon them through the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gives them, while the world looks at the gospel and sees foolishness and weakness, God gives them wisdom in Christ. He makes Christ their wisdom. He makes Christ their righteousness, their righteous standing before God. They are justified, and his righteousness of his righteous life is imputed to their account. They are both forgiven of their sins, and his righteousness is imputed to them so that they are approved before God and sanctified, set apart to his use, just as he started the book, Paul did, with calling them the saints of God, with calling them sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So this is what God does. He takes these lowly people and he calls them into this fellowship of Jesus Christ and makes them saints, holy, righteous, gives them wisdom in the Lord Jesus Christ and redemption. All of the amazing and marvelous works that the Lord Jesus did on our behalf in paying the price for sin and in delivering us from the bondage of sin, God the Father applies that to this poor and socially unacceptable person like me or you and makes us his favorites in the world. That, why? According as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Whoever boasts, let him boast in the Lord. So my brethren, this, Paul says, this is an antidote to division that is fueled by pride, boasting, or self-appreciation. You look around you and you realize, I am here in the church of Jesus Christ, not because of my attainments in wisdom, not because of my attainments in righteousness or holiness or my merits, not because of my spiritual pedigree connected with the Apostle Paul or, you know, Apollos because he's more eloquent or Cephas, you know, Peter spent more time with Jesus. No, 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 not your spiritual pedigree, not your connections, not, not the wisdom and power that you think you have at a human level, not because you have a great mind that can gather and process all of the doctrinal truths of the Bible, but because of God's sovereign choice. And if it weren't for that, you would be in hell or headed to hell. But with his sovereign mercy in calling you by the gospel, now you're in his house. And so now how you relate to your brethren in the house, you're all of you are saved beggars. You're all the low ones of the earth that he has raised up. His choice, his calling, his mercy. The Father called me. The Son welcomed me and the Holy Spirit through the party. Now I'm home, but it's by none of my merits. It's all of his grace. And so that affects how we relate to our brethren in the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that's Paul's point. His argument, which I have done a poor job of unfolding, is that the effectual call of God shows that we should glory in him and not in ourselves. Amen. And that should increase our unity as a church. So were you called? Are you one of those called ones? Have you experienced the forgiveness of sins? Are you a saint on your way to eternal glory? Are you confident that at the day of Jesus Christ, you will stand before him blameless by his merits and by his grace because of what he's done for you in his redemption? You were called by the Lord, by God, by the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So boast in the Lord. Let your flesh wither. God never was impressed with you anyway. He loved you. He wasn't impressed with you. That's Paul's point. And then, my friends, were you never called? Did you never experience the work of God breaking your heart and then healing it? Have you never seen your sin and the greatness and glory of Jesus Christ as the Savior? Cry out to the living God, the one who acts, the one who works, the one who saves. He hears. He says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knewest not. That's Jeremiah 33, verse 3. He says in Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. 
Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Why pray? Is it a man mantra? Is it just something you go through some like hocus pocus thing? No, Isaiah is calling us to pray because God answers. He has mercy. He shows mercy on the wicked who cry out to him, who forsake their way. They forsake their unrighteous thoughts and they return unto the Lord and he does something. He pardons. He has mercy. Jesus is a great savior. So listen for his call in the gospel. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for what you have done for us. Oh Lord, as we think upon your mercy to sinners like we are, and Lord, your faithfulness in carrying out this glorious work, even thousands of years after you have done what you recorded in the word of God, you have connected us to those things by your work for us and in us. And oh Lord, as we look at that process, as we think about what you've done, and Lord, we realize you have, not, you have not done it in a way that exalts the name of any man. You've not done it in a way that makes us seem like great and successful people. Oh Lord, there is no legacy of greatness here. Oh Lord, we are simple sinners who needed a savior and you saved us. So oh Lord, have mercy upon us that we would love our fellow saved sinners, that we would not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, and that we would bow low before you at all times, boast in our great God, and oh Father, that you would give us the experience of seeing you save many sinners around us. Oh Lord, save the lost. Call those who are in their darkness into light. Oh Lord, make them saints. Call them into the fellowship of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in Christ's name, amen. amen. If you would please stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Amen. You may be dismissed.